Okay, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak at this uh, Today, um, as Sebastian said, I will talk about combinatorics of amplitude hedra. Um, and um, this is based on my work in the last couple of years and some work in progress. And I wrote the references that I used uh, in the talk and um, something which might be useful at the, at the Blackboard. Um, so in, a, in the last decade, there has been a paradigm shift according to which physical observables and uh, the physical property can emerge from the underlying geometry and combinatorics. And this has led to a major interaction and also insights both in the fields of combinatorics algebraic geometry and in theoretical physics, in particular in quantum field theories and scattering amplitudes. Um, this uh, progress like, uh, started um, a while ago, but um, basically uh, it, it, we can say that the closest to um, the geometric formulation that we know today uh, came from, um, for example, Henry Hodges, who saw that uh, some algebraic identities between scattering amplitudes could be seen as coming from uh, triangulated some polytopes, and scattering amplitudes could be seen as volume of polytopes. And meanwhile, um, uh, the, there is a binary formulation of scattering amplitudes in terms of um, uh, uh, K planes in n dimensions, which is the Kristianian, uh, by uh, Nimar Kanyamad collaborators and also uh, Mason and Skinner. And these um, two approaches somehow uh, combine together to uh, lead to a geometric formulation of scattering, scattering amplitudes in planar n equals first of mills, uh, which is, uh, goes under the name of the amplitude hydro in 2013. And uh, in, uh, in these geometric settings, triangulation will play an important role because they are um, in knowing triangulations of these underlying geometric space allows us to compute the physical observable, but also it can shed light on uh, um, some symmetries or some underlying dualities and provides also different representations of the same scattering competence. Um, just to give an example, uh, some other examples. This was only part of the more general paradigm, which brought to uh, discover more geometries associated to other physical observables, uh, for example, like some cosmological polytopes. Um, which can describe the way function the universe in certain cosmologies. The associahedron can describe three level scattering amplitudes of the joint scalars, and so on. Uh, more recently, uh, there's been something called the momentum amplitudehedron uh, for certain theories, and that um, will be relevant later in the talk. And these are geometries describing um, these scattering amplitudes directly in momentum space. And then uh, maybe in the future, we will hear. Uh, we'll see a paper by me and collaborators also about surface hydra, which is like scattering amplitudes in tri uh, trace phi to the cube. Um, and uh, this is somehow um, the list might continue and hopefully will continue. So um, yes. Do you have a general characterization of the type of quantum field theory where you can expect such a that's nice. Um, that's a good question. So in general, we don't have it, but um, there um, <clears throat> somehow the uh, the combinatorics and the underlying geometry has to reflect the factorization channels and the physical uh, the analytic structure of the scattering amplitudes, and so it's related to some principle that your quantum filter might have like locality and unitarity. But it, I mean, there is no general principle which tells us now like for which quantum filter we expect this uh, this kind of geometry. So it's uh, it, we we're just trying to somehow. Uh, compute see the structure and trying to find, uh, so let's say, what's the, the question under, of which the answer is scattering up we're computing. Or, so it's more, uh, it's not a, um, for now, a top down approach. So bottom up. So are we discussing planar amplitudes or any? Um, well, um, so for, uh, it depends what you're doing, but for any possible, it's planar. Yeah. I will mention more specifically, this was more of the introduction. Okay, so um, I might not, might not have to convince the, this audience that scattering amplitudes in quantum field theory are important quantities you might want to consider uh, somehow to bridge the theoretical uh, prediction with some experimental uh, findings, especially in the particle colliders. And um, uh, of course, these scattering amplitudes can be computed perturbatively uh, in, in certain theories using Feynman diagrams. And um, already though, uh, the, um, but already, um, I mean, Feynman diagrams are the standard method to compute these scattering amplitudes perturbatively, but on one hand, the computational efforts for Feynman diagrams is, are increasing with the number of particles and uh, with, the, with, the, with the order of calculations, but also um, uh, conceptually. Uh, so for example, if you want to consider uh, the scattering amplitudes at three levels of the zero order for true to four gluons, uh, that was computed by Park Taylor in 85, and it was already a huge effort for them at that time and led to more than 100 pages of calculation. But um, however, they uh, added this comment at the end of their paper, which said that they hope to obtain a simple analytic form for their answer, uh, making their results not only an experimentalist, but also a theorist delight. And they did find this expression, which was this one. So this one, um, uh, the notation here just in uh, some spinnerality variables, which I'm not defining now, but just to see that it's very compact compared to the 100 pages. And this tells us that it, <clears throat> the calculation of Feynman diagrams is not only very uh, hard, but also the answer might actually be much more simple than the calculation. 
And this, this hidden simplicity of the answer is obscured by the standard methods of Feynman diagrams. And in some sense, is the tip of the iceberg that this uh, hidden simplicity might actually be related to some other methods, which might expose this simplicity more directly. And these methods are exactly uh, on shell methods that were actually uh, cornerstones or of modern calculations in uh, scattering amplitudes in the 21st century, which are like recursion relations, generalizing time and, and other methods. Uh, and in particular, this has been applied uh, in many um, in many theories. And one of the examples I want to consider today, and that also many other people have considered in, uh, recently, is uh, um, uh, any post for superior meals. And in particular, people have also considered the, the planar limit. Uh, but um, let me say that this uh, any post for superior meals <clears throat> has been considered because it's a kind of supersymmetric cousin of QCD. And because as someone also called that the hydrogen atom of the 21st centuries because of some uh, kind of integrability property. Um, related to the presence of um, a kind of infinite dimensional symmetries, Youngian symmetry, that sometimes is regarded as a hallmark of integrability, and that allowed to apply methods inspired from or proper of integrability, like spin chains and other methods to compute certain quantities of n equals four. And finally, well, um, and, and also it has been the protagonist of many dualities and correspondences, like the SFT and amplitude with some dualities, etc. Uh, for our purpose, it always been, uh, it, it's also been the, um, the main character, main protagonist of the geometrization of scattering amplitude, as I mentioned before, which led to reformulation of these scattering amplitudes in terms of geometric objects like Grossman and amplitude hydra. And uh, this has been part of a more general framework of positive geometry, which led to the many other examples in my previous slides. Um, of geometric objects encoding physical observables. And so in our work, our work in general is, uh, is focusing on exploring, triangulating, and discovering positive geometries relevant for any post four and also beyond. Um, so I just gave you the introduction, uh, the outline of the talk is that I would introduce uh, what the amplitude hidden is in connection to computing scattering amplitudes in uh, and any post four superior mills and um, uh, triangulations, uh, that's uh, that, how those plays a role. Then I will show uh, how a, um, a duality of the scattering amplitudes is related to um, a geometric um, a duality between the amplitude hydron and another object, which is the momentum amplitude hydron, which we define. And, find, and then uh, generalizing this duality for other family of amplitude hydra, we discover some relation with a very uh, beautiful polyton, which is the hypersimplex, which is a uh, very nice rich combinatorics. And finally, um, looking at other families of amplitude hydron beyond. The physical case, we um, land into kind of a terra incognita, means that like unknown land, where uh, there are many new uh, surprises and unexpected things, and uh, rich phenomena that people that were kind of not expected that this is a large work in progress. So not, not and finally, we will complete summary of that. Okay, <clears throat> so let me start with the definition. So the amplitude hydrons. Um, or the amplitude either are finding of objects depending on three non-integer uh, numbers n, k, and m, and was uh, recently discovered by physicists in 2013 by Nur Kanyamet and Yarov Vavchenka, and uh, can be seen as a generalization of polytopes inside the Grossmannian. Um, just before continuing, let me just uh, review what a Grossmannian is. So the Grossmannian GRK, comma n, in this case a real Grossmannian, is a space of k-plane in n dimensions. And an element of the Grassmannian can be represented as a full rank k times n matrix, where the row span is giving exactly this k dimensional plane. So we can think of Grassmannian as a space of k full rank k times n matrix modular row iterations. So this is, for example, a matrix two five times four. And we can use some certain coordinates in this Grassmannian, which are called duper coordinates. Let's denote that the node p sub i. And these are just a maximum k times k minor of this matrix C. Where the index i is just the column set that I use to compute this minor. So, for example, in this matrix, p13 is the determinant of the minor, uh, 1 3 obtained by the column, uh, taking the column 1 and the column 3 of the matrix. p24 is obtained by taking the minor uh, of the column 2 and column 4, etc. Okay, um, there is a very nice subset of this Grossmannian, um, which was studied by um, uh, Posnikov in 2006. And, uh, hinges on previous theory of total positivity by Lustig and Ritz also. And it's just a subset of the Grassmannian where all these Lucre coordinates are non negative. And for example, um, if you take the matrix C and you compute all the Lucre coordinates, you can see they're all non negative and uh, also comp computing all the others. And this tells you that C represents a point in the Grassmannian, positive Grassmannian. Um, um, the original name is totally in the negative Grassmannian. Informally, it's called the positive Grassmannian. Okay, so at this point, we can define a map, which is called, uh, we call Z tilde, the amplitude map, 
which goes from the space, the positive Grassmannian k comma n, to another Grassmannian k comma k plus m. And in order to define this map, we uh, need to fix uh, n times k plus m matrix such that all its maximum minors are positive. So once you fix these matrix with this property, then these maps are tilde is just right multiplication by um, of this matrix C. So if we start with a point in the positive Grassmannian, we just right multiply by Z, and then we get a point in the Grassmannian k, uh, k plus m. And the image of this map, uh, the image of the whole positive Grassmannian under this map is, is the amplitude here. Okay, so any question regarding to this? Uh, this is kind of maybe, uh, on the one hand, very simple, on the other, very abstract, in the sense that you cannot see still what it is um, in practice. So I will show some example in the next slide. Let me just report the definitions here. So let me just give specific families such that you can visualize it a bit better. So since it depends on three parameters, let's fix some of them and see what, what happens. So if we fix k equals one and m equals to two, then we can show that we get basically n goes in two dimensions. Um, more precisely, it's in projective space, but we can kind of slice the cone and get a, a, an n goal. And the, the, Z, the Z matrix, which is fixed, just represent the vertices of this polygon. So the rows of the matrix C represent these vectors, which are uh, vertices. And um, basically, the image on, on the positive line is just the image from um, which spans the interior. So it's a kind of convex sum of these vectors. Um, right. So the second example is when we fix k equals to one, but m is generic, um, and and this gives uh, polytopes, a, spe a specific type of polytopes. If I'm not going to details what they are, but some polytopes in a, in a m-dimensional polytopes or polytopes in projective space. And uh, sorry. And then um, this um, these were also well studied. Uh, and finally, um, as a kind of known family, if we fix n equals to m plus k, we get back the positive Grassmannian that we defined before. So as you see that uh, specific families of the amplitudeidon are positive Grassmann Grassmannians and polytopes. So in some sense, these statements uh, can be uh, understood a bit better now that we see that more polytopes and Grassmannian are specific cases of, of these things. However, what about the other values of n, k, and m? So, the other, for the other cases, there have been more uh, recent studies by both mathematicians and physicists. For example, when m equals one, uh, Karp and Williams show that it's um, equivalent to a kind of bounded region in certain hyperplane arrangement. For m equals two, uh, there have been many studies. Um, what I wanted to, to highlight is also be a topic of this talk. I want to highlight that somehow it's often used as a toy model for m equals four, which is the one relevant to physics. And it's also kind of how enter some one loop calculations in planar m equals four superior means. Um, uh, but for us, it will just be as a term model which exposes a very beautiful combinatorics in connection with hypersimplex and, and tropical geometry. For then, we proceed n equals four. It's the one relevant for three level scattering amplitudes in n equals four superior meals. And we will see that it's a kind of t duals to some other object, which is the momentum of the region. And finally, um, beyond n equals um, for hyper greater equal to six. Um, as I mentioned before, this has been uh, deeply unexplored and also led to some immense surprises. And uh, just as a final comment, um, for, for, for some reason, we don't want to consider other odd cases because they don't have some duality of expectance or they might not be very interesting or maybe too, um, too ugly to consider. Uh, but we are more interested in the even cases for, for some reasons. Um, Sorry, okay. so the yeah. analysis of the various values of M, is it? Really, a case by case to understand what is going on. We have some general pattern of what changes. I mean, I, I, read the, uh, I don't see in general what you should expect, for instance, again, it's very large or. Oh, yeah. I mean, already, as you said, already for M equals greater than six, there are, it's, it's so, so wide, so, so unexplored. So, M equals four, um, the, first, the first proof that the triangulation of this space actually gives you scattering amplitudes or actually gives. Um, it is a, that the triangulation that was conjectured by physicists is a triangulation which just happened last year. So after uh, more than eight years, I mean, after eight years. So just to say these objects are quite hard to, uh, to analyze from a pure math perspective. And already the kind of tall model, I mean, was true, uh, unveiled the surprising connections with some hypersimplex and tropical geometry. So they're very rich. And um, I, what I want to highlight that um, if it seemed hard to go from n plus two to n plus four, it seems even harder to go from n plus four to n plus six. Uh, and uh, the phenomenon that happens in n plus six is um, is not just a kind of extrapolation from what happens for n plus four. It's there are many like new wild phenomena. And just to highlight the complexity of this of these uh, of these spaces, then the definition seems very easy. But then when you study, go to study deeply the geometry, that's what you find, and also that's the beauty of the object. It's in some sense it's very natural, but if you study the geometry, it's very rich. 
And N equals four already consists of three levels scattering up with N equals four, which is, you might agree, it's, it's like a non trivial problem uh, to split out this rational function that completes all, completes all the three levels scattering up of N equals four. And N equals six is a even generalization of those. So it's even crazier. Okay. Um, let me just say that how do we go from there to scattering amplitudes? Well, um, this is not the end of the story. For each amplitude hidden, one seeks a canonical form, uh, which is a top meromorphic differential form with the following property that it has to have logarithmic singularities on all the boundaries of our affinity hydron. So a uh, simple pose on, on all the boundaries. Uh, and also, in general, um, it's conjectural that this form is consistently unique for, for the affinity hydron and it's an improved. But for other spaces like polytopes, this has been proved that it's existing it's unique. Um, just to give an example, um, we can consider one special case of a big hydron where the field is a triangle for these values of parameters. Um, and here I just wrote the triangle in the framework of, um, of a big hydron. But what I wanted to highlight here is that the canonical form can be expressed according to certain variables in this notation. But what I wanted to stress is that these three factors in the denominator, the vanishing of these factors in the denominator corresponds to three poles, which map into the boundaries of the three boundaries of our, our triangle. So the, the vanishing of this pole uh, of this um, is the determinant of three vectors here is actually corresponding to, um, to this the line, sorry, the line one, two. And so for the others. So this is just to give a flavor of how this canonical form uh, is related to the geometry. And so um, three level scattering amplitudes in n equals four superior meals can be extracted from a canonical form of the amplitude hydron where you fix m equals to four. And then you interpret the n and k in a following way. So m is the number of scattering particles and k is related to the VCD sector. So in n equals four, you can uh, divide your amplitude in VCD sector according to the number of particles with certain uh, elicity. So k is the number of particles with elicity minus or this number plus two, so it's related to the number of particles of ECT minus. And the, the step from, um, from um, to extract scattering amplitude from the canonical form is very, uh, is very straightforward. Uh, it's the technical I won't, I won't say, but it's very straightforward. What is hard is to find this canonical form. So if once you find it, then the step to put the scattering amplitude is quite easy. So just again, to give a flavor of what happens, the easiest example, it's already four dimensional, so I cannot draw it, but it's, it's easy because it's a four dimensional simplex. So um, the easiest example, um, it's, a, it's a simplex and the canonical form is proportional to this rational function with five poles corresponding to the five, five facets of this four dimensional simplex. And there is a way to extract um, uh, the kind of scattering amplitudes expressed in uh, some kinematic variables called super momentum twisters. Where again, what I wanted to highlight is that the five poles of the scattering amplitudes correspond to the five facets of the simplex, and the poles of the scattering amplitudes correspond to factorization channels. And this is a pictorial of the scattering amplitudes with uh, three um, elicity minus gluons and uh, two pluses. Um, and okay, so this is more pictorially what, what, what you expect in a sense. Okay, let me go on. And so the question is how do we find canonical forms? So that's also a, a question. Uh, well, one way to do it, and um, uh, one of the ways actually you can do, um, um, there are other ways you can do it for polytopes and for known objects, but in general, the only known way um, to do it is by triangulating our, our genetic space, triangulating the amplitude hydron. And why is that the case? Is because the idea is that we can first triangulate the amplitude hydron, and then we can sum over canonical forms of the pieces of the triangulation. So we can subdivide our space into smaller pieces for which we can compute the canonical form, and then we can sum over the canonical forms of each piece to get the canonical form of the whole space. Um, then the question is, what do I mean by uh, pieces of the amplitude hydron? Let me more, be more precise. The amplitude hydron is the image of the positive Grassmannia under a certain map. And so pieces of the amplitude hydron, uh, I want to consider them as images of pieces of the positive Grassmannian. So I want to consider that. And why do I want to do that? Because these pieces of positive Grassmannian are very natural to be, um, uh, have been studied very well in the combinatorics world um, by always by Posnikov. And in particular, the positive Grassmannian can be partitioned into very nice pieces called positive red cells. And basically, positive red cells are a subset of the positive Grassmannian whose points have. Uh, a certain subset of Plucker coordinates which are zero and the complementary subset which are strictly positive. So once I fixed a certain subset of Plucker coordinates that are zero and the others uh, strictly positive, I define a certain subspace of my Grassmannian and that is called the positive red cell. Well, that's called a positive red cell if it's non-empty because of course the Plucker coordinates since are minors of your matrix can, are not independent. 
So it's a non-trivial problem to understand which subset I can set to zero, and I can keep all the remaining Kruger coordinates that are strictly positive. Uh, and this problem has been completely solved uh, by Posnikov. And also these pieces are very nice. They're, um, the closure is homomorphic to closed balls, and there is a CW complex, so it's the nicest possible structure you can get. Um, let me give an example. So this matrix is the same matrix that we saw before. Um, and you see that all Kruger coordinates are positive except for one. So then all matrices which have zero Kruger coordinates P1, 2, and all the positive, the other positive belong to the same cell. And this is the cell is denoted as S sub M, where M is the list of labels of the non-zero Kruger coordinates. So there is a nice combinatorics, and there is a bijection between these positive cells with many combinatorial objects like uh, decorative permutations, maybe graph. I will not go into, into today. I just want to use these cells to uh, map into the amplitude and define it, divide the amplitude uh, in terms of images of this cell. So then I can be more precise and I can say that the pieces of the amplitude are just images that are full dimensional of these cells under which the map is injected. This is a natural requirement you can do. And uh, I call these positive tiles because I want to use them to tile my space, my, my, um, my amplitude drone. And the triangulation of the amplitude drone is just a collection of non overlapping tiles that cover the whole space. So, as you might expect. And uh, for technical reasons, sometimes we call these positive tilings because triangulations in the setting of polyhedral geometry uh, mean something else. So, not to confuse, uh, in, we decided in the math literature to call them positive tilings. But for the purpose of our talk, I will use triangulation of the positive tilings interchangeably. Um, okay, so let me give an example. Um, again, uh, one of the easiest examples of amplitude are n-gons. And if you take a, a pentagon, the pentagon, uh, we know how to triangulate the pentagon. Uh, one way is to split it in as a, these three triangles. And um, each of these triangles can be seen as an image of a certain cell in the positive Grassmannian. Um, I, I know it's a kind of convoluted way of seeing a triangle, but it's still part of this, of this framework. And um, the way you can compute the canonical form of a pentagon is summing over canonical forms of each triangle. And if you remember, we know what is the canonical form of a triangle from previous slides. You don't have to remember the expression, but you remember that it was straightforward to basically write down because you didn't have to triangulate the triangle. <laughs> so you could write it immediately there because it, the map is injected from the gross money to, to, to the image in, in, in the case of, 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 of triangles. OK, um, before moving on, I wanted to stress. I, I yeah. So. Uh... You, you can't take a different triangulation of the pattern or, or you get the same result? Oh, okay, sorry. Good point. <laughs> that's exactly this. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. So, uh, of course, there is not only one triangulation. We can choose other triangulations. And if you choose another triangulation, then what you have is that the same things hold, that you can sum over canonical forms of each triangle and you still get the same answer. However, like in the right hand side, it looks very different. So, that's a way to generate an expansion of a certain of the same quantity, but in using different terms. So they have the expansion of the same uh, canonical form in terms of different terms. And this is like something that you're also used in physics. Like if you if you want to compute scattering amplitudes and use modern methods, for example, recursion relations, according to how you use those recursion relation, you might expand uh, your amplitudes in terms of the sum of different terms. And if you choose a different recursions, you still get the same answer, but then the expression is very different. And all these kind of zoo of possible expression you can get can be interpreted in the case of, so in this geometry as basically putting together the same pieces that builds up your geometric object as a, as a whole. So kind of you're breaking down a nice vase into a, a, um, a zoo of pieces, but you know invariantly what this vase is. And it's given by uh, the uh, definition, invariant geometric definition. So to summarize this, uh, this part, computing scattering amplitudes amounts to find canonical forms. And finding canonical forms amounts to triangulating the amplitude hydra. And uh, the um, stepping in reverse is easy. Uh, moving forward is the difficult part. And in particular, um, the computation of scattering amplitudes is actually for any post for so for whatever um, physical observable has an underlying geometry is uh, translated into finding a triangulation of that space. Um, and, and then, as we, as we saw, each triangulation gives a particular expression for your physical observable, your scattering amplitude. OK, now uh, we can move on and can ask, OK, but how do we triangulate the amplitudehedron? How do we find triangulation of the amplitudehedron? Um, OK, so um, the problem of finding triangulation, uh, of course, is a uh, geometric object, of course, is very old, and, but we can, again, take our favorite example, which is the pentagon. Of course, we know what are triangulations of pentagons. There are five of them. And uh, we can arrange them on, on these vertices, one, two, three, four, five. 
and we can place them next to each other if they're related by a very minimal move. So if you see that these two triangulations are, are related by simply flipping a diagonal. So if you start from a triangulation, you can just flip a diagonal, you can get another triangulation. And in some sense, this gives you a notion of uh, proximity or adjacency of triangulations. And if you use this combinatorial rule, you can build up basically a, a polygon in this case. Again, it's a coincidence that this is a pentagon. Uh, but in general, if you consider triangulation of hexagons, you get um, a nice geometric object called the associahedron, which uh, has been studied in the, in the 60s. And also recently, um, people from physics gave even a new realization of associahedron, like in my collaborators. Um, and we know how to describe them. Okay, so uh, if you consider the hexagon, the polytope encoding triangulation is this uh, object which is called an anahedron, and it has 14 vertices because the triangulation of the hexagon are 14. Um, and triangular is where it's the vertices. Yeah, category. exactly. Like others are there. Like all possible polygonal subdivisions are required from the full. Yeah, point. yeah, exactly. So that's exactly uh, what I'm going to say now. But yes, intuitively, um, well, let me just give one second and I, I, I will reply to your question. Um, then there is a natural question whether can we go beyond polygons because it's two dimensional and the people are being considered in polytopes. Can we build a poly can we build a geometric object which encodes the combinatorics of a given polytope? Sorry, the combinatorics of triangulation of a given polytope. And the answer is yes, given by Galton, Zabisky, and Kakara in the 90s, which tells that if you start with a polytope, you can build another polytope, actually, with the prescribed dimensions, which encodes all the triangulation of the original polytope. And uh, going to your question, the, the, the uh, combinatorics is the following. So in technical terms, the phase positive of your polytope, oh, sorry, the phase positive of your secondary polytope is isomorphic to the positive of subdivisions. In practice, that means that vertices correspond to triangulation of the original polytope, and um, um, edges correspond to triangulation which are very close to each other. In a sense, you can obtain from them using a minimal local move, uh, which is called the bystander flip. And then facets correspond to the course of subdivision. So you can course some triangulation up to getting to course of subdivision. Uh, like here, for example, uh, you can course a triangulation of a, a pentagon by just removing a diagonal. So the edge here would correspond to this course and triangulation. Um, OK, so let's just apply to um, a physical case. So we know that um, the scattering amplitudes and um, three level n equals four superior means uh, for specific cases uh, corresponds to polytopes. And in particular, the so-called NMHV sector. So if you consider this amplitude, which has n vertices, sorry, eight vertices, sorry, eight, uh, eight points, and uh, uh, three helicity uh, particles with helicity and negative helicity, uh, this corresponds to a polytope of dimension four with eight vertices that I cannot draw. But I can still draw the secondary polytope, which is the polytope encoding the triangulation of my original polytope. And this is exactly the polytope here. So this has 40 vertices, which means that each vertex is a triangulation of the given polytope. And if you run all the previous discussion, then for each vertex here, you get a triangulation of my amplitude And for each of that, you can express your scattering amplitude. So each of these points represent an expansion of your scattering amplitudes according to how I triangulate my, my space. Uh, so it gives you the same the combinatorics of, of my uh, representation of my scattering amplitudes in many different ways. This is just an example. But um, somehow this, um, this kind of mathematical story uh, really banks to a generalization like, is there a way we can encode combinatorics of triangulation of arbitohedra? So is there a way to kind of a secondary arbitohedra which encodes these combinatorics? And this is exactly what I'm uh, wondering in a sense. Okay, let me uh, move on by saying that the combinatorics of, of triangulations are, uh, let me give an example for which combinatorics of triangulations are related to, to something more physical. And this is the case when I go back to the amplitudeidron for n equals four, which is uh, the one related to scattering amplitudes uh, in n equals four superior means. And n equals four superior means scattering amplitudes enjoy uh, enjoys a certain duality, which is called amplitude with solute duality, for which there is a dual formulation of scattering amplitudes. In a sense, one is in a momentum space, or more precisely in on shell space, um, so called spinoricity formalism, and the other uh, side. It's something in the dual space, which is easy to understand if you have momentum P1 up to Pn. And by momentum conservation, this polygon closes, then we want to consider axes, which are vertices of this polygon instead. So just difference of um, difference of axes is equal P, equal P's. So this is called the dual space. And you can even go further, I won't define it here, but something called momentum twister space, which even a nicer kinematic space, which encodes both momentum conservation and on shell conditions. Um, but the point is that this duality of scattering amplitudes uh, tells you that um, 
the uh, some hidden symmetries on this uh, on this side turns uh, is a subset of uh, superconformal symmetry on this side and vice versa. And so it's 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 basically um, a very nice uh, duality which comes from some underlying uh, duality but we can read more about this in in these papers that in the first more review paper. Um, and the question is then now uh, the amplitude that we discussed. Uh, was sitting more on this side. So was computing these scattering amplitudes more on the side of momentum twister, so on this right hand side. So the question is whether there is another geometry which can describe scattering amplitudes on the left hand side, direct to momentum space. And um, uh, the, uh, the answer is exactly this you new know, amplitude, the momentum amplitohedron, which we define, um, which somehow um, um, is defined, it gives a positive geometry for three level scattering amplitudes of any post for superior mills in uh, momentum space or in spinnerless space. Um, just give me briefly um, the flavor of how it's defined beyond the details. It's still defined as an image of the map from the positive Rosmanian. Uh, it's slightly more complicated, but it's still, uh, the map is still defined starting from fixing some matrices, capital lambda and capital lambda tilde, with some positivity properties so that capital lambda tilde and capital. Uh, and the capital lambda orthogonal are, are maximum minus to be positive. And then the map is just by right multiplication of C and C per. So taking the image of this map leads you to this object. Um, and beyond the details, what I want to say is that these two spaces actually looks very different. They have very different dimension. Uh, like this is a four times K, and this is a two N minus four. So different dimension, they look very different. So what do they have in common? They should have something in common if there's, there is underlying physical duality from scattering amplitude. And in particular, we can ask, okay, how do we compute scattering amplitudes? Again, we can start with a triangulation of the momentum amplitude, and we can sum over canonical forms of the tiles that we use to triangulate to get a canonical form of the space. And then we can, there is an easy way to extract uh, scattering amplitudes from this canonical form. And this amplitude is expressed in, uh, in momentum of in space. And somehow these two amplitudes should be related by this duality that was coming from physics. Um, so the spaces look very different, but what, what do we have in common is that we conjecture that the triangulation of the space are actually in bijection of the triangulation of the amplitude hedron. And this, this duality, somehow we call it T-duality because it was inspired by kind of this uh, duality here. And it's the same duality that uh, people before the formulation of amplitude hedron used to relate um, Rosmanian formulation on these two sides. However, there was still the lack of like, genuine positive geometry which described both sides. Um, and that now these two positive geometries somehow are t-dual in a sense that they share the same combinatorics of triangulations. Okay, so this is you know, with, uh, um, to express that uh, the combinatorics of triangulation is the consequence somehow of this underlying duality. And from physics, we should expect these amplitudes to be closely related, but geometrically these problems look very different. So it's a kind of non-trivial mathematical statement to claim that these objects are at the same triangulations. Okay, so. Um, since the leader are not only for m equals four, then a natural question is to understand what happens beyond m equals four or for other m. Right? So let's, um, uh, so this was uh, like to motivate the combinatorics of triangulations are kind of important and relevant also for this uh, physical duality, but we can try to even study them for different m and try to learn something. And um, if you consider the easier case somehow for m equals two instead of m equals four, then this led us to discover um, some new connections with these objects here. So before moving, I wanted to mention that um, this is a polytope, so it's kind of surprising that a, a, a space which is uh, like a subset of the Grassmannian, so um, defined in a way I said before, it's a nonlinear space, um, is, can be somehow dual to some easier nice polytope like the hypersimplex. And the hypersimplex is not just a random polytope, it's actually something which is very nice and nicely studied, and it was originally um, studied by Galton, Goransky, McPherson, and Serganov in the 80s in connection to Torus orbits and the Grassmannian moment maps. And it has deep connection with the uh, theories of matrix and positive tropical geometry, cluster algebras, and tropical positive Grassmannian. If you don't know many of the most of these words, I uh, just wanted to say that this would be like cutting edge research in the math literature. Uh, this is a citation before our paper, uh, so it has, of course, to be continued. And uh, these were instead citations from the physics world. So the physics world started using these words. So they started using tropical geometry, cluster algebra, and the tropical positive Grassmannian, actually for other purposes. So for still within the, the realm of scattering amplitudes, but 
there was no connection yet with the amplitohedron in a sense. So it was like very interesting uh, object to study both in math and physics in the last years, but no one knew there was any connection with the uh, with the amplitohedron. So let me let me just uh, briefly define what the hypersynthesis is. Let's start from here. It's a polytope of dimension n minus one in Rm, so it's called dimension one. And it's obtained by the convex hull of certain vectors, E sub i. And they're very easy vectors. They're vectors which are only zeros and one. And they have one in position given by the index, uh, by the set capital I. So they have k plus one once in these, uh, these vectors of k plus one once, and the remaining are zeros. If you take the convex hull of these zero one vectors, you get the hypersimplex. So this is an example of the hypersimplex 2,4. Uh, which is lives in R4, but we can, since it's three dimensional, we can take a certain projection. So, um, combinatorically, it looks like this, this one. So, it's basically an octahedron. Okay. So, this is like the type of objects you want to consider. So, they look very simple. But uh, by the studies of, uh, I said before, it can also be seen more conceptually as coming from the positive corresponding. And remarkably, um, it can be seen as the image of a, a certain map or moment map from the positive corresponding. And this moment map has a certain definition, um, but I want to go with it just to say that there is a way to map from the positive Riesmannian to RS. And this is actually, if you want to go deeper, it's as connection with torus orbits in the Riesmannian, torus action in the Riesmannian. Uh, but uh, just to say that in, in summary, uh, there are both the amplitudeidron and the upper simplex are images from the positive Riesmannian, but the amplitudeidron is a map which is much simpler in a sense, it's just multiplication by Z. And this is a map which looks a bit very different. So. They're very different, and one is a subset of the Grassmannian, the other is a subset of Rm. Uh, this is dimension 2k, this is dimension n minus 1. So they look very different. So what do they have in common? I have a question. Yeah. Is there any way you can derive the park tiller amplitude from the amplitude hydron or the hypersimplex or the Grassmannian? Can you repeat again? Sorry, how? How is there any way you can derive the park tiller amplitude? Yeah. From, from the yes. Grassmann. So in other. Start, I mean, since the uh, part Taylor amplitude is uh, MHV, uh, I mean, I guess at three level, uh, you are, uh, the, it's MHV, you don't see it in the, in the amplitude hydron because that would be just one, um, but you can see it from the momentum amplitude hydron. And the, from momentum amplitude hydron, that comes just from the Grassmannian 2 comma N. Uh, and so the, it's well known that the Grassmannian 2 comma N has N facets. And these n facets exactly corresponds to the i i plus one poles in uh, spin velocity variables that you have, uh, you have in part tailors. So just combinatorically, you, you can see already. Um, I didn't show you because, as I said, the MHV amplitude is trivial in the kind of dual settings because it's one. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want, I can explain a bit later after after the talk. But um, that's a good question. So in that case, the, the momentum amplitude hydron is literally isomorphic to the positive Grassmannian GR. Um, um, yeah, so that, that's really easy to, to find. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, basically isomorphic to the positive Grassmannian GR 2 comma N. So if you look at the uh, uh, facets of this, uh, of this space um, as a positive geometry, you find that this, uh, there is a bijection with those facets and the poles of your MHB amplitudes. <clears throat> Okay, so um, right, so we have the upper simplex on one side, the uh, epitwitter of amicus two types on the other side, and uh, the thing is that this is well-known objects uh, with also uh, nice combinatorics, and this, whereas the geometry was not fully explored, but what we found is that generalizing the notion of t-duality, we found the correspondence between these two spaces looking at their triangulation. So in the conjecture uh, back in 2020, that was a bijection between triangulation of the uh, amplitude of m equals two types and the triangulation of the hypersimplex. And uh, we proved this conjecture in, uh, in last year in full generality. And let me also mention that um, here we talk about positive tilings of the hypersimplex because we want to consider to subdivide the hypersimplex into polytopes, which are images of certain positive cells. Um, so for example, here, um, um, the hypersimplex uh, that I showed before can only subdivide, be subdivided in, uh, in these two ways according to the definition of positive rate tilings. And these two ways of subdividing the upper syntax are dual to the way you can subdivide um, the, this case of the amplitude, which is just trivial because it's just a square. Um, so that's the only one I can draw here. <laughs> uh, but this, you can see that this is the kind of in bijection to each other, but of course, in general, it's much more complicated. 
um, for example, already from k equals two and n equals eight, uh, we have more than six million positive challenges that you can compute um, on the side of the hyper simplex. And by TB1, it gives you more than six million triangulations of the amplitohedron. Um, and I stress again that every, um, in the mathematical world, uh, a lot of things are developed, lots of algorithms, a lot of um, um, theorem and, and, and concepts are developed for polytops, but not for these subset in the gross manians that uh, the amplitohedron is an example of. So having this connection uh, was a kind of a very surprising and very crucial to actually understand the geometry of the other side. And uh, importantly, also um, for Huizmer, uh, of course, uh, for, for physicists, in a sense that um, since the amplitude is connected to scattering amplitudes for m equals four, um, there, the computation of scattering amplitudes was connected to, uh, was performed successfully using certain recursion relations, which are called BCFW recursion relations. And this is uh, connected to the combinatorics of triangulations in general. So in general, you can find triangulation of the amplitude recursively um, for using this double recursions for m equals four. And here we are m equals two. Since it's a kind of easier version of m equals four, we should have expected that we also have some, some kind of BCW light recursions. And that's what the Baum here found in 2019. They found that triangulation of the m equals two amplitude could be found somehow in terms of certain recursions. Um, and these diagrams will say that uh, they have a specific meaning, but for our purposes, it just means that you can find triangulation of these amplitude just using triangulation of amplitude with smaller n and smaller k, which is the basis for your, I mean, that basically gives you the, 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 the recursive structure. Um, and um, using this duality, that also tells you that the other syntax is in structure, so then this, this is what, what, what we show. And the BCW recursion, BCW, the, the triangulations obtained by BCW recursions are nice classes of triangulations, but they are not all triangulations. Um, another nice class of triangulation um, um, is are obtained from another object, which is called the tropical positive Grassmannian, which was defined by Speyer and Williams in 2005. Um, I won't have time to define it here, but it's connected to tropical geometry. And basically, it's a very nice object which, um, uh, whose geometry, linear geometry, because it's a set of cones is a fun, uh, encodes the triangulations of uh, some type of triangulations of the hypersimplex. And this is kind of, um, well, this is, was not too surprising, I have to say, but it was still a new result uh, that was actually in conjunction with also Nima, uh, Thomas Lavin, Spradling. Uh, but it was coming from a generalization of basically the same story without the word positive. And then you just have to show that um, adding the word positive everywhere that was true as well. Uh, but the surprising thing is that actually using T duality, that this object in tropical geometry was connected to our amplitohedron. And this uh, gives a way just analyzing uh, these objects to find triangulation of the amplitude. So as an example, um, we have, um, uh, there is a way to, to go from maximal cones of this geometric space to triangulation of the upper simplex. And uh, for example, for n, it was nine k equals three. This uh, tropical positive Grassmannian 4,9 has more than 30 million maximal cones. And it was actually computed by some physicists because that was relevant for uh, other applications in scattering amplitudes, not, not related to the pseudohedron. And that was actually happening almost like a few months before, or years ago, uh, or a year before. So it was very convenient to have this number. And we, using this, uh, this computation, we, we could basically produce more than 30 million triangulations of the hypersimplex, which are t dual to the for more than 30 million triangulations of the amplitohedron. And um, yeah, so this is just. To give a flavor that um, this T duality was a generalization of T duality I mentioned before, relates triangulations, 30 million triangulation of an object which is an eight dimensional polytope with an object which is a six dimensional subset of the Grassmannian. So it's, it's kind of very surprising. Um, yeah, and of course, T duality has also, uh, as many other correspondences we've discovered, and so the relation between these two objects is tighter and tighter, but we still don't understand why they should be related geometrically, uh, or even if you understand more and more the relations between them. Yes? You mentioned again the triangulation leads to a certain expression for your amplitude. By doing yeah, this. so, um, okay, so for m, for m equals four, yes. For m equals three, the time model. So it's, 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 model, yeah, it's giving you a rational function, yeah, which is a kind of, yeah. yeah, I will comment a bit later on uh, what's the so, so, about, so, so it's giving you the 30 million equivalent rational functions, or at least in yes. some ways. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is this is what uh, what's happening. Okay. So um, 
let me uh, finish this, um, this journey through different families of amplitude events by moving towards something which is a bit more uh, adventurous in a sense um, for m equals six. And um, uh, this is a kind of a terra incognita in a sense it's more work in progress. And also uh, there are lots of surprises and lots of new phenomena that we, we explored. And um, I'm borrowing some uh, um, approach that from some mathematician friends uh, when you have some unknown objects, you can imagine the object enters your room and, and then you can say, what kind of question would you like to ask to your object? So what kind of question would you like to ask to the M equals 6 amplitude address if it enters in the room? And um, well, one question uh, you can ask is what, does, what type of boundaries do you have? And the reason why you want to ask this question is because boundaries of these geometries corresponds to poles of the canonical form, which in turn would correspond to some kind of factorization channels of your amplitude if your geometry would actually be corresponding to some physical observable, so for m equals four, that's true. And factorization channels of your amplitudes, of course, are physically very relevant because they are dictated by physical principle like locality and unitarity. So it's it's a well, very important question to address. And just as a reminder, for m equals four, uh, the amplitude theorem was related to scattering amplitudes in n equals four superior mills. So in a three level, um, the uh, when uh, the boundary structure uh, should reflect the fact that when you have, uh, when you approach the pole, there is a factorization in two. So the amplitude should factorize in two parts, uh, with each piece as a smaller number of particles and a um, smaller density sector. And uh, somehow, in n equals two, um, even if it doesn't correspond to an amplitude, if it corresponds to an amplitude, that would correspond to a factorization in one, in a sense, which is. The kind of recursive structure that the when you approach the boundary or the pole, you will see some kind of rational function, but with a smaller n and k. And then it's natural to expect the parameter equals six, there's a factorization in three, in a sense. So there is when you approach the pole, in a sense of your of your amplitude in quotation mark, sorry, in the quotations, uh, you would expect some kind of factorization in three parts, which is very uh, very weird, very interesting. However, this is not still the most interesting part. <laughs> the most interesting part is that actually there is, in, there is even more. So it, there is not a natural extrapolation for we found out the frame equals six. There are new phenomena. So um, basically everything we observe until m equals four as the boundaries are linear. So linear in the sense that the amplitude is inside the Grassmannian. So the Grassmannian itself is not linear, but the boundaries are always intersection of hyperplanes inside the Grassmannian. So it's the kind of, uh, the, uh, the, the, the least worrying nonlinearity in terms of hyperplanes intersected with the Grassmannian. Uh, or they can be expressed as a kind of vanishing of some determinants. That's, that's, that's what you, want, you, you, can, you can say. Um, but in the, the odd n equals six, what we find is that this is not, even, that's, that's not true anymore in general. So you still have some kind of linear boundaries, which is the one given by factorization in three. But then they also have something more. And this something more, it's it opens up a new zoo of poles. So these poles, since linear boundaries, there are like a finite, like there is, um, if you only have linear boundaries, since the degree, of course, is, uh, is capped to one, uh, there is a finite amount of them, but uh, we don't know what is the whole zoo of poles if you then open up to degrees of higher degrees degree poles. And this means, for example, that the factorization, whatever factorization means, is maybe, for example, giving factorization in six or even more complicated. So there is a kind of very non trivial jump from, from, from n equals square n equals six. And uh, you can, if you're still um, have uh, energy after asking uh, this question and being, uh, you're surprised, you can also ask your, your n equals six something with your other questions. You can ask, uh, can we triangulate you? Can we find a triangulation? Or you can ask, do you have, do you have some kind of BCW recursions that we satisfy? You can ask, uh, do you have a T-dual, so another object uh, that we can use um, in duality to find triangulations, thoughts? And finally, um, uh, this is like a more uh, high order speculative question of whether there is any kind of space time of PFT picture emergent. And I put in quotations because, of course, uh, by unitarity, we know that by standard unitarity, we know that this is like not possible to have a factorization in three or more. But that's why, is there any kind of framework through which we can interpret this function as coming from uh, some kind of generalization of what unitarity means or what uh, the QFT picture could mean? So, whether this can be interpreted as a kind of amplitude really of, some, of some sort uh, in a more abstract way. So, to Question. include, part, yes. What exactly do you mean by the fact that the boundaries can be non linear? Yes. So, um, um, this is. So as I mentioned before, the boundaries of 
uh, the amplitohedra, uh, where just intersection of planes with the Grassmannian. Uh, so yeah. I call it linear. And the reason they're linear, if you want to be more technical, is that I can use certain, I can use Plucker coordinates in the Grassmannian, uh, as I mentioned before. And these folds will be linear in those Plucker coordinates. Um, whereas, whereas the other, in the other cases, if I use Plucker coordinates, uh, if, if I have Plucker coordinates in the amplitude hydron, the, the boundaries relies on the vanishing locus of the polynomial, which is not linear in the Plucker coordinates. Okay. So it can be oh. so it can be quadratic in general will lead you to some kind of factorization in six and, and so on. And we don't know this kind of the zoo, but I mean we, we kind of know example by example, but we don't know like the general story for for general uh, K for general is n. But we suspect for people who are more interested, there is still a deep connection to cluster algebra. So in a sense, the cluster algebra provides a uh, very nice guidance and very nice story uh, to tame this new zoo of poles. And actually. It's from that perspective it's actually very natural that you get something new here. But uh, from if you were naively not thinking about that, that would be a very, I mean, a very surprise to coming from from these aspects. So anyway, so, just to say, yeah. So triangulations would give simply says which are not planar or something. They would be curved or something. Is that so, is that what? You mean? Yeah. So triangulations of amplitude either, um, in general involve species which are non-linear mm -hmm. because they are image yeah. of course by itself inside the Grassmannian. So they they would be kind of the version of simplices, but inside the Grassmannian. But it doesn't mean that they have. Um, I mean, they are more or less they're playing the same role of synthesis in a sense that your map is injective and the image is full dimensional, but the geometry of the species itself is non-trivial. So the geometry of tiles. That you use to tile your computer is also not trivial to understand what, they, what it is. But once you know that it's easy to find the canonical form, and you find once you find a triangulation, then everything is fine. Um, just is a generalization. And if you're interested, this whole um, kind of generalization of simplices or polytops inside the Grassmannian are so called Grassmann polytops. So that's, um, that's kind of uh, it's a term of grass tops. Um, it was uh, analyzed first by Thomas Lamb a couple of years ago. Um, any other questions? Maybe uh, to, uh, to, um, to understand a bit better this general M, uh, is there an easy way to understand why the M equal three, five, and so on cases are not? Uh... Oh, yeah. So the reason why we don't want to consider that, that I think I can give you two answers. One uh, is related to the fact that already for polytops, if you consider polytops in uh, odd dimensions, uh, which are cyclic polytops, the types that emerge from the epithelium. They have a property that the number of tiles in a triangulation is not fixed. So you can find triangulation with a certain number of tiles, it's triangulation with different number of tiles. So the combinatorics is a bit uh, is very different. So you can have a non-continuous jump from odd to even. Whereas for even uh, dimensions, the cyclic polytops, any triangulation has the same number of simplices. So already that gives you some, some differences. And from my perspective, the, the reason why you don't want to consider odd is that you don't have a key dual. Because T dual is defined only for even M, because you go basically from uh, an amplitude with even M to a momentum amplitude, which is defined by somehow taking M divided by two. So it's kind of two copies, intertwined copies of M divided by two amplitude um, in some sense. So the map is literally not defined, the T dual is not defined for odd M, and we don't expect it to have that. And, um, the only example of uh, all them is M equals one that I, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the talk and it was studied by Karp and Williams. And uh, they started from M equals one because they thought it was the easiest, but then they realized it's actually totally different. I mean, it was still doable, but uh, there some phenomena were very uh, pathological to the odd cases. Um, and uh, that's why then people started wanting to study the even ones. Is that related to the fact that it's a moment map? So I of some moment map. At most, but the geometry. So, um, well, I mean, the picture with the moment map that we, you know, so far it's for n equals two. So we don't know. We don't know. We don't have a generalization of the hypersymplectic story for general n. So we don't know. So we don't know. Like the t dual of of this um, amplitude for n equals two is somehow this hypersimplex, but for n equals four, this dual of this is a momentum amplitude, yeah. but it is not a polytope, and it is not related to the moment map. So it's a great question to understand like, why is them also there for any equals true? Why is there a moment map? Why is it related to the n equals true We don't know any, is it, whether it's related to a higher m as well, and how do you do it? Uh, just let me just add one sentence that I want to say that this kind of uh, work in progress puts us actually the amplitude reader as a kind of terra incognita in a sense that 
there are many new phenomena that are like waiting to be explored, which is not just extrapolations of what we knew before. And uh, well, this literally is a generalization in a sense of scattering up because n equals four in a kind of non-trivial way, because uh, even you might not know what is the key, the the amplitude picture, still mathematically it's a generalization. So the complexity is a higher complexity, which somehow comes from um, um, it reduces some kind of easy, <laughs> easier version from A plus four. So it's nice to consider that. Um, yeah, so let me just. Um, so I just. Could, yes. So in M equals six, you, you have this factorization in three, but do you still also have factorization in two or no, just in three? No. Uh, well, um, okay, yeah, I mean, it's a particular case when one of the, like one of the three pieces could be trivial in a sense, so you could think as a position in two. Yeah. You, you could still have it. Yeah. But um, I, I presented the more generic cases. As, as a scattering up, because it's always in two, but somehow if it's degenerate, then it could be interpreted as a kind of collinear or some a kind of MHV or MHV bar. So it's, it's a kind of lower vertex that you can interpret. Okay, so let me, it, I'm almost close to the end and uh, I will use the same slide that I started with. So I hope I convinced you that uh, there has been a lot of developments in terms of uh, understanding the geometry underlying some physical observables and, and from which we can make some pro physical property emerge and the role of that the triangulations play in, the, in this game. And um, we saw that um, in scattering amplitudes are central objects in fundamental physics. And we saw how the presence of completed scattering amplitudes related to triangulate these geometric spaces, the amplitude hydra. And in particular, um, um, I wanted to, to mention how um, uh, the problem of understanding the combinatorics of the amplitude hydra, so how do we do it? And as a review, uh, for M equals four, we saw that uh, the combinatorics of triangulation of the amplitude hydron was dual uh, to a combinatorics of triangulation of the momentum amplitude hydron, which was a new object we defined to describe three levels scattering amplitudes in n equals two square mills directly in momentum space. And generalizing this duality uh, for, um, for different cases, uh, we've discovered this remarkable connection between the amplitude hydron of the m equals two type uh, with the hypersimplex. And this also sparked new connections between positive theoretical geometry cancer algebras and amplitude, which was uh, unknown. And finally, going beyond M equals four, this uh, opened up randomly new features, which uh, points a deeper structure in combinatorics and, I mean, a wide generalization somehow of amplitudes and how they factorize, but that we still don't understand. So it's more um, speculative um, thing. So let me just end with a few sentences. Uh, well, at least this slide. So uh, to summarize, we want to understand the combinatorics of the amplitude reader in general and also of its triangulations. And in general, we would like to discover new amplitude reader for other physical observables um, within this framework of positive geometries. And of course, the kind of dream or the speculation, of course, is that how we would like to rethink CFTs and space time in novel combinatorics and geometric terms. Okay. Uh, before ending, like, uh, I was end with a sentence, which I think uh, is inspirational. So uh, pure mathematics and physics are becoming ever more closely connected, though their methods remain different. One may describe the situation by saying that mathematicians play a game in which they themselves invent the rules, while physicists play a game in which the rules are provided by nature. However, as time goes on, it becomes increasingly evident that the rules which mathematicians find interesting are the same as those nature has chosen. And this was said in the 39 by Dirac. So I think it's very, um, all right. And uh, let me know if you have any questions regarding the talk. And also want to mention that if you're interested um, uh, next year, I mean, next month, I don't know, there's going to be an upcoming book about the combinatory aspects of scattering amplitudes, amplitude either and duality and cluster algebras uh, based on uh, my PhD thesis. Uh, thank you very much. All right, do we, do we have any questions, Florence? Yeah. How computation effective is it actually? So let's say if you wanted to compute like some and particle scattering amplitude uh, next, next to MHD, can you actually do it? Um, well, yeah, so you mean in terms of computation? So it depends on, I mean, uh, the three level amplitudes are kind of known in terms of, uh, it depends on how you express them, but they're, yeah. But, but so it's effective to construct like these triangulations with the canonical forms. Uh, well, um, so this is, let's see. Um, 
these geometric constructions are more relevant conceptually, and I think at loop level they might be relevant in a sense uh, if you want to consider them more at loop level. So, um, for example, you can have like some deep similarities that you can prove just from the geometry, or you can uh, you can do that. Or um, I don't know, like understanding combinatorics of triangulations also connects to um, what Neem has been doing with the surface hydra, and then in that case. That's a kind of like easier version of much easier version of the amplitude theorem because the amplitude theorem deals with like a gauge theory and like, more more than, yeah. like same nature will be any two force of MLs and experiment that comes to you and, and wants to measure like some production or something. Like is it actually useful? Would it be useful to compute things in the light of yeah. arms? Well, I mean, for now, the answer is no for the sure. reason that what I told you is the tree level, um, but there is an amplitude theorem for loop level, which uh, gives you the integrand, and so from there you have to integrate, right? So, but already uh, this kind of genetic approach gave, gives you um, um, a full description of the integrand, somehow. and then from there you have the higher divergence theorem that's going to have to regulate. But that's in connection to the new work about like ne negative, ge sorry, negative geometries, not negative geometries, work the is not doing, or even like some kind of works about deformation of amplitude, which you can take some, I guess, the amplitude either mechanical form form it in some way and integrate it. Um, now you cannot integrate it. I mean, at the level, you don't want to integrate anything because it's a rational factor. At loop level, you get integrands that you might want to integrate. But the problem, of course, is that everything is a canonical form, which is the logarithm singularity. So if you integrate it, it's diverge. Right? Uh, but um, you already know for other examples, like uh, even like um, string theory, that so you can just use the, um, write down the canonical form of the M, not M, and then put the regulator, which is a covalence factor. And that's kind of, that's the job. <laughs> so it's an open question how you can do this for loop amplitudes for the amplitude it themselves. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, the, I think that's the answer for, for that. Um, yeah. so, so, so I understood that uh, if, you're, so if you're studying tree level amplitudes in N equals four, you would be naturally led to this geometric object for M equals four. Yeah. What's like the, is there like starting point, like physical theory, which you're starting with whose answer is encoded in like the amplitude hedra for other M or are you just studying it as like a math problem, which you think is going to be the answer to some physics? Well, that's a good question. I mean, as I mentioned, we don't know what it is for M equals six, but not even for M equals three. Okay. So it's, it's an open question. So, so you're just studying it as, a, as like well, a math problem. I mean, yes. I have to say though that, uh, as I said, the combinat what I call combinatorial factorization, which is the fact that if you look at the boundaries, what is the recursive structure of the boundaries? Prime equals three looks like it's factorizing in one. So I don't know what kind of amplitude might factorize as well. Mm -hmm. So if that's from linearity, it makes sense. So that's the point. Um, we don't know, but it's a good question. And I also have to mention that for M equals two, there is this connection with the tropical cosmic crystalline, this object in tropical geometry, and the same objects appeared with the computation of the generalized by joint scalar amplitudes. That is being formulated as well. So also those kind of generalized by joint scalar amplitudes are not amplitudes themselves, but they were kind of used as a kind of generalization of amplitudes from the scattering equations perspective. And uh, also that they're, they're not um, physical amplitudes, but they're kind of mathematical generalization. And it seems that also in that case, the tropical flux of the was entering, but I don't know whether there is any inter like, is any connection between those type of amplitudes and the amplitude to amplitude leader itself. Also, that could be a, a, a good question. But do you have a good reason for expecting that? It's even well, interesting other than M equals four. Well, okay, for M equals six, actually, a question we're trying to understand is what kind of kinematic invariance those poles correspond to? Like for M equals four, you know the, the physical poles of your scattering amplitude is related to the vanishing locus of the vanishing of Mandelstam invariance, uh, which is like sum of momentum square in the sum of theories. And uh, for M equals six, you expect there's going to be more complicated kinematic invariance. So, whatever, even if we don't know. <laughs> What's the underlying quantum field theory? You can still think about what are these functions that you might have uh, that where the poles are. And in momentum twisters, it's a kind of it's not so clear to map back to the momentum space beyond M equals four, or we still have to understand exactly what kind of kinematics environments they do, they have. But it's kind of telling you, uh, well, the fact is factorized in three somehow, like in M equals four, you have you know uh, the in the dual space you have two points of space time which becomes uh, non-separated. And that gives you a pole because the difference between two dual coordinates is a sum of momentum square. So the, the, the fact that two points in dual space are not separated corresponds to the fact that the sum of momentum becomes uh, on shell, goes on shell. And maybe from equal six, 
let's tell them how they have a, a instead of three, you have three point invariants. So you have maybe three point in the dual space, which builds up an invariant whose vanishing lock is corresponds to the post discovery of, of, of this, this function. And um, it, as a, it's more exotic because we don't know what it is. Um, but these are kind of general functions that, uh, sorry, generalization of, of functions that appears in any bus score. So it's pure mathematical question, but it's really interesting to see whether there is any answer, like physical motivation or physical underlying physics behind that. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, this is not the first time people have been questioning generalization of amplitudes. And the bad joint scalar theory is one of those that people generalize by joint scalar amplitudes. Um, yeah, and the question is whether yeah, there is also any relation between those and, and some of these amplitudes. So. Presumably, the N M equals four case is related to the BCFW recursion relations. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So the um, I, I showed you before uh, that the M equals two could be uh, computed the recursive between BCW like expansions, but also the M equals four, of course, uh, has this BCW recursive structure. And it is actually how it was um, shown to be, uh, I mean, the show evidence to be true. So what people, people do is like they define this amplitudehedron uh, using this um, simple and general definition. And then they um, mapped the BCW recursion coming from BCW recursion relations in scattering amplitudes into a, a recursion in the triangulations of the amplitudehedron and check that the pieces that we're getting naturally from your amplitude were given a triangulation, were, was giving a triangulation of your space. So it was literally coming somehow, even historically, from the BCW triangulation. And uh, yeah, so the boundary structure literally can, that's like the triangulations of the amplitudehedron uh, literally mimics this recursive structure of BCW. But not all triangulations are BCW like. So the, the, that's also the interesting thing is that you can get expressions of the scattering amplitudes which don't come from any BCW recursion. So you can just decide how, as you wish to, to find any triangulation and that might not come from any physics expression that you might find using physics methods. That's also the advantage of having a geometric invariant way of describing these amplitudes. No, for instance, uh, what would the M equals six case really lead to in sort in sort in terms of uh, recursion relations or relations of that sort? That's a good question. So this is what they're working on. Uh, it's for now. Um, we found some kind of BCW recursion relation for some examples. I mean, we found them for an infinite family, but not for all elicities. And uh, it's even an open question whether. There are triangulations at all in a sense, in a normal sense. So there are many, many surprises. But for sure, there is a for some families, subfamilies of M equals six, for some infinite subfamilies of M equals six, there are some BCW recursions, but they are more they are more complicated and reflect this extra zoo of calls. And that that we know how to do. But in general, we don't know whether that's generalizing um, beyond the cases of the explorer. So it's a, it's an interesting problem. And also another thing is like, it seems that the M equals six case uh, seems to form a loop. I mean, it forms a, a loop instead of a, uh, instead of a propagator in the case of the M equals four case, it kind of forms a loop. So is there any intuition coming from that? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, the, um, I mean, it's a bit. It was a kind of a cartoon I drew, and um, it could. I mean, the loop story could be make could make sense in some uh, uh, using some playby graph, maybe. I mean, in a combinatorial sense. But uh, yeah, I don't know what there is any intuition about it. Of course, if you look at it, it's like a loop. So if you were interpreting as an amplitude, you would think, oh, but there are three propagators going to zero in the case of like three. Uh, but that's not the case because that's a codimension one pole. It's not codimension three pole. I don't know how you interpret it. Um, I have to say also um, that similar poles where you have factorization, well, I'm not sure whether they are really similar, but kind of a new type of poles were also observed by uh, these by generalized by joint scalar um, amplitudes, but also there they are weird uh, factorization. But I think this kind of new zoo of poles is, is even more new, newer than that one. So, um, and it's not clear the connection with that. I'm just saying that there is some similar flavors that was, was found, but um, it's um, yeah, it's still under exploration. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to say more. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for your question. All right. Do we have any final questions?
If not, then let's thank everyone.